Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is May 7th, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Tom Fandel. Tom, how are you today? Very good, thanks. It's good to see you, sir. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 78. And your current address? Natick. And um, marital status? A uh, very nice wife with five children, four girls and, and a boy. How about grandchildren? Uh, Thirteen grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. Holy mackerel. <laughs> that is wonderful. We're, we're going to put you down as being a family man. <laughs> Great. Where were you born, Tom? Cambridge, Mass. Cambridge and raised over there? I raised there. Went to uh, St. John's North Cambridge and Rinch Tech High School. And I got out in June of 42 and signed up in the Navy. Okay, so in 42, you were still in school? Yes. Were you? Tell us what it was like to be in school in 42. Um, how old were you, about 17, 18 years no, old? No, I was 18. And uh, everybody wanted to go into service. And a lot of guys did. A lot of fellas actually went up to Canada and joined the Canadian Air Force. And uh, as soon as I had the opportunity, a very good, very good friend of mine who was also a, at school, we signed up in the Navy, a post office square in Boston in 42, and went away in June, uh, early July of 42 to That was for it. 52 or 53 years ago, or whatever the math is on that, uh, 58 years ago. Why was everybody so anxious to get into the service? That's that's not always been true. Well, I still have great faith in American kids. Uh, we had we had the Jap bombers at Pearl Harbor the year before in December, and we were all pretty mad about that. And everybody I was aware of wanted to go into service, and that's about it. We we uh, I was studying aeronautical uh, engineering at at. Uh, Range Tech, which had a great course in it. I thought I could get in the Navy Air Force, but that didn't materialize. In, in 42, and you're 18 years old, you said, um, what were your options vis-a-vis uh, -vis the military? Were you going to be drafted as soon as you got out of school, or uh, where did you stand uh, in the draft? I couldn't honestly say. I have no idea where I stood in it. I knew I was just signing up as quickly as possible. And that was it. I had no choice of waiting for a draft. I wasn't going to be drafted. And can you tell us why you joined the Navy, of all the forces? I was going to join the Corps. But I took a look around, and I felt I wasn't big enough to join, you know. And um, the Navy had everything I wanted to. And I, I just wanted to get on board ship and throw some ash cans at some of these people. So you went down and, uh, to Post Office Square in Boston? Yeah. And did you go by yourself, or were any of the guys that you knew, uh, did they go with you? My good friend Red Collins went with me, who uh, eventually went at Peleliu, hit Peleliu. So the two of you walked into the post office, I guess? Yeah, there were hundreds of people in there, hundreds of guys from all over, signing up in the Navy and the Marine Corps. You signed up, you come home and you tell your folks, uh, guess what I did today? That's a very good point. My father, who was a veteran of World War I, congratulated me and thought it was great. My rest of my family was a little annoyed at me. Had you discussed it with them at all no. before you went down? No, you, you and Red went down and signed up. Exactly. And did the Navy, uh, did, did you sign up for a period of time, like four years? The plus, duration of the war? Yeah, right. The, the war plus the, uh, the duration, right. And uh, then I, got a, I received an interview at North Station from uh, Air Force people. And uh, I guess I wasn't up to their grade. They were very good, very nice. And they said, you'd be a great mechanic in this Air Force. And that's what I was hoping to get. Didn't materialize that way. I wound up opening a repair base over in New York. So you, very important. you wound up in the United States Navy you went home, you said all your goodbyes. They, they called you to active duty. Tell us about leaving 
uh, Cambridge and Boston? Well, I left Cambridge. Uh, I don't recall how I got got on a bus. I guess we went into Boston, got on a bus, and went down to Newport, Rhode Island, for boot camp for six weeks, and um, that was an experience and a half. <laughs> Tell us about boot camp. Boot camp was was something else. We got in there late in the morning, if I recall, and. Uh, we had doctors checking us from head to toe, as you know, and um, went on for hours and knocking you with Mercuricom where they had checked you and asking you some pretty difficult questions to answer, you know, as a kid. And then uh, we were assigned our gear, our clothing, and it was getting to be late, at, late in the afternoon. We had chow, and then we went to, uh, got all our clothing, and we went, walked across the island, this was islands down there, and we got into hammocks. Well, that was something. Every guy that went into a hammock and rolled out was pulled out of the outfit. We never saw them again. When I, flew, when I got up there six feet and rolled in, I didn't dare move until I got oriented, you know? Yeah. This was a test to decide whether or not you'd stay in the outfit? I think so. What was the point of it? Uh, good point. Uh, psychologically, I wouldn't know what the doctors had in their mind, but uh, a lot of fellas fell out of the hammocks. They were rolled in and out six feet down. That's a long drop. And they just pulled them out of the company. We never saw them again. We had a... Um, Did Red fall out of his hammock? Uh, I wasn't with Red. We were split. I don't know where... We were in a different groups. I, I didn't see Red after that for till after the war. Do you have any idea how large a decision this made? Uh, what happened to the guys who fell out of their hammocks? They were sent, we know they were sent across to another building and we didn't, no, we didn't know what happened to them. We did not know. We did not know. And uh, then we got a, assigned a, a DI I'll never forget his name, Spadacini from Philadelphia. A drill instructor. Yeah, great guy. Rough, tough, brutal language, but as fair as you could be. And we stayed with him and uh, for six weeks, and it was hot summer, you know, and Glenn Miller was playing his beautiful music, and we're drilling out in the field and so forth. And I had about 321 guys in my outfit and uh, we got along good, no problems. What did you like about boot camp? Anything, or was it all pretty? Rough? I liked it all. I didn't dislike any of it. But I, I know in the swimming, when we went in these big tanks to swim, I was about the worst swimmer in the world, and I could swim, but I couldn't swim there. I, I just could not swim. I, they they threw me back in a couple of times, and used some choice language, you know, as the Navy would. And I just got through it. That was the only problem I had. We did a little shooting, not much, small boy shooting. And, uh, you know, just the whole procedure of learning the routine and getting along with people you don't know. It was a great experience. Other than falling out of hammocks, what other kind of tests did you go through to decide what you would do in the Navy? Well, a lot of written tests. Mm -hmm. um, Physical tests, I suppose, you know. I wasn't that big a guy. I was probably 135 pounds, probably five, seven and a half or eight. Not too big at all. Some of the guys were very big. We played that big medicine ball, you know, in the field that everybody bangs in and slams around. <laughs> That's rough. Did they tell you um, within that six weeks how you had done on those tests? And no. When did you uh, find out what you were going to do in the Navy? The very good question. I, I saw certain guys going to uh, radio school. Um, we were just, our people were loaded on a train uh, right out of boot camp when we were finished. I uh, know we did see our people, you know, our people come down to see us, my father and my brothers and so forth, for a day or two. And then we. Down at Newport? Right. Yeah. And then we, when we finished, after we graduated, we went on board trains and we had no idea where we were going. I wound up in New York, of all the places. 
But New York uh, was in a very serious situation, and we didn't know it at the time. You know, these subs are hanging off the coast all along there, sinking a lot of stuff. Where, where specifically in New York were you? Staten Island. Staten Island. Yeah. That's like it, it's the, the throat of New York would be here, Brooklyn would be over here, and the island would be over here by Jersey. And that was your first base after boot camp? Right. What did they do with you there? I worked with uh, uh, mostly older people, older Navy guys, that uh, broke us in on main overhaul on these small ships called PC boats. PC? Yeah, patrol tell, craft. Tell us what that is. Patrol craft. And they were about maybe 200 feet long. And they had three inch guns fore and aft and loaded with depth charges. It was a brutal ship to ride. It was You were under the water half the time. You should have got sub pay for it. Is, is this an anti-submarine vessel? Absolutely, yeah. The whole thing was anti-submarine base. And what was your job on board this ship? I wasn't on board ship too much. I was on, on a repair base, repairing the main propulsion and auxiliary engines for these. Then I made some runs down to South America, and um, uh, then I, I came back, and I st went to the base again. I was in what they call Atlantic Fleet Training Command. Okay, uh, on this PC, you went down to South America? You're on duty now aboard a naval vessel. Right. Tell us about that sailing off. And uh, had you ever been to sea before? No. No. Did you take well to being on a small ship like this? I, I could see a destroyer, but this was smaller, way smaller than a destroyer, and it was rough. You couldn't eat. All you could have was sandwiches. And general quarters was primarily. And we never used our three-inch in any kind of uh, affair, but the depth charges, we used a considerable amount of them. Tell us about your first cruise. Where did you go? Recife, Brazil. Um, we came back. We went down there long. We came back, and uh, um, we had contacts, you know, with subs. We threw off cans. I couldn't say we didn't get any confirmed kills, but uh, we just, we were taking escort, escorting ships down there. And you picking were on, up ships coming up. Is this up. on convoy duty down to the tip of Brazil? Right, yeah. right, right. And when you throw cans overboard, you're talking depth charges. Yeah, the, 300 the y pound. Gun and 300 pound depth charges. You roll off two, and you shoot two off at the same time to give a nice pattern. And if anything's within that pattern, it's going to be in trouble. Were you trained to do this? No. No, that was my my station. I was main propulsion down below on the engines. But, you know, in combat, as you know, you're all assigned certain things and yeah. you do whatever you have. Cooks will pick up guns and so forth. That doesn't make any difference. Can you give us an example of uh, your onboard ship and they sound general quarters. What was your station? What were you supposed to do? I was back aft with the, with the uh, people on... Um, the depth charges. You'd think I'd be down below, but I wasn't. That's why I wasn't assigned someone else was. I wasn't rated. I don't think I was hardly rated at all at that time. Probably third class. But uh, it, it's confusing, but it's good. It's organized, and uh, the water can be brutal. The Atlantic is, is tough. Not as bad down there as it is in the North Atlantic. That's very bad. But you then I got back. Equator the, on that. Pardon? You crossed the equator on no. that trip? No. 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 Not quite. Almost. Not quite. I was going to say, I, 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 did they put you through the routine? Oh of yeah. The, no. The Neptune and all of that. No, that that would have been nice, but this was a little, a little serious. We didn't get that far as the equator, but um, it was very interesting. When when. These explosions, tremendous explosions, are going off. Um, did you look for? Tell us about what you look for to know whether or not you hit anything. Well, you primarily look for oil, but um, these can these ships were so bloody small. The vibration, the screws would be right out of the water, shaking, you know, vibrating like mad. And uh, you'd look for any debris, 
But uh, the skipper and his people were up on the bridge looking. We couldn't see everything. We could only see low and hang on to what we had to hold on to, the racks and so forth. But um, it would be hell and high water down below if, if one of those things came near you. Describe what was going on around you. How large a convoy? Were you in the middle? Were you out on the edges of it? Out on the edge. Did you have air cover? No. No, not at that time. What other warships were with you? Not Just a few of us PC boats. Nothing bigger than that? I don't recall. There might have been a can on the other side of it. I can't recall. I, I don't recall. And you made the trip down, turned around, came back up? More or less, yes. And uh, That was the end of my sea duty, primarily. Not all of it, but primarily there. Then I went back to New York, and I worked for with these people, and I learned a great deal on stripping these engines apart and finding the problems. Then I was transferred. I was transferred to Brooklyn Navy Yard. About what date was this, Tom? Pardon? About what date? Probably forty, middle forty-three, when okay. we were really getting somewhere with the submarines. We were really making an effect because we had sonar now, and it was working very good. Very well. Can you tell us about when, uh, say, they put the curtains up along the beaches at Asbury Park, Atlantic City, uh, oil on the beaches, that kind of thing? I, How I, close were the, was the danger? The danger was immediate. It was right there. Uh, I don't know. New York City was never blacked out during the war. Uh, this is incredible. And the beaches were all lighted up. I don't know of curtains or anything that ever went up. I wouldn't know. I'm not aware of it. But um, why they didn't just come into New York Harbor, it's beyond me. They could have sunk a lot of French cruisers and everything in there. Because I saw them. I was right below them going over to Brooklyn. And we would fix these engines, and then we'd give them a test run either up the Hudson or down. That's a big, big area. Or down to Brooklyn or over and, and then back to the base. You say French cruisers? Oh, yeah. Big French cruisers tied up right in the harbor. We had it. Is this the one that had a gun that was uh, broken in half at Iran in, the, in, in November of 42? I couldn't honestly answer that. I know she was there, a beautiful ship, and we were waving to the when we were going by on the stern. I didn't get up forward to see their guns. and. Uh, Eventually, I went over to Brooklyn and picked up a couple of Navy prisoners, and my orders were to take me to Norfolk to pick up a new destroyer, the Shannon. Beautiful ship. You Dual. say Navy prisoners? Oh, yeah. Who, you know, you, who you, were they? Our own people that were in trouble. Okay. Handcuffed. And you took them down? I took them, two of them down to uh, Newport with my orders for the ship I was going on, assigned to got down there and she was out on shakedown and then she continued right through the canal and out and she didn't come back. So I was laying there for about two or three weeks. Then they assigned me to the Caribbean to a uh, two-star admiral, I don't recall his name, and we had 300 people in our outfit. We went down there for training on sonar and depth charge runs, you know, and destroyers and so forth. What and ship is this on, uh, the Shannon? Pardon? What ship were you on now? We were attached to a repair ship called the Altair. But we, uh, when we got down there, we went on the beach, and um, we had three captured Italian submarines that we used for training for our people. We'd send an American signalman on board, enlisted man, with their whole crew and officers, and they'd go out for a day or two ahead of us. Then we'd take the destroyers out, five or six of them, and I would go on board with an engineering officer, and he would do the paperwork topside, and I'd go below and observe, strictly observing, you know, no work, and uh, watch the crew under damage control and so forth. And when my assignment was finished, I'd go back aft and sit and watch the boys shoot charges off and mouse traps. And the officers would come by me and... Okay. Where is this in the Caribbean? Off Guantanamo. Trinidad, in that area. Were well, you based at Guantanamo? I was based at Guantanamo, right. Did you get to see any of Cuba? 
Oh, yeah, I got on Liberty a, a few times, got around to Cuba, got up to um, San Juan Hill, where Mr. Roosevelt was. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were wonderful, lovely people. A great many of Cubans worked on the base itself. This is a huge base, big place. And uh, it was a beautiful country and no problems, had great liberties. Where did, where did we get three Italian submarines? They were captured from the uh, Europe or Mediterranean, and they were brought over, and they were all repainted. Not in, we got them from Florida. They come out to us from Florida, and uh, they were beautiful ships. Beautiful so, ships. So your training was uh, to test the uh, sonar capacities of the destroyers, right? And exactly. the, the ability of the submarines not to be detected, right? And we hit them every time. We'd shoot mouse traps off the bow. What's like, a mouse trap? It's like a big rocket about yay big, long with wing, you know, a tail on it. And send off a patent like that. And you had to make contact with the hull for an explosion. And in our case, they weren't loaded with anything to hurt these people. They were loaded with a green dye. And up would come the green dye, and we, we got a lot of beautiful hits. You mean you literally hit them with the Had to hit the ship. You had to hit That's the hull. That's great accuracy. You had sonar now. Sonar was coming into its own. It's what saved us in the Atlantic, more so than radar, in my opinion. Very important. Very important. And then um, we'd be out two or three days, and we'd come back, we'd go ashore, and sometimes we'd ride cruises. I, re I remember the one of the carriers rode a carrier for a while, um, all out in this whole area, you know big piece of water and um, we, we'd come back in and uh, that's more or less what we did while we were there. At this time was uh, the German Navy concentrating its subs uh, in the Caribbean or were, had they moved further north? The Germans in 43 had, had really suffered. Uh, they, they were at their apex in 43 and they had three aces that had well over close to 40, sub, 40 ships apiece, they had sunk. That's a lot of ships. And they had moved into the Atlantic coast, and they were going down the coast towards uh, uh, deep South America. And they probably had bases down there. We heard they did. We had people in Bermuda that uh, were checking on them, you know, anti-submarine people. But it was a serious thing for a while, and they were right off the vineyard, and they were right off, uh, a friend of mine sunk one off the Cape, in a Navy blimp, but then at that time we had we were getting blimps into the into the picture, and they were great for anti-submarines warfare. But we uh, I know of one case in Maine, uh, Bar Harbor, I believe, a German sub was on the surface doing some repair work, and a blimp came over and expected to you know take it, but the German gunner took the blimp instead. The guys fell out from. Hundreds of feet and all that. Yeah, that's quite a target. Yeah, can't yeah. miss it. How, yeah. how can you miss it? So you're in the middle of 43 and you're in a pretty dangerous place. Uh, did you ever see a sunk, uh, a sub sunk? No, I did not. I did not. Uh, but we saw results of, well, we picked up German bodies in New York Harbor, sailors, and um, I was on a ship that picked up one of them. Tell us about that, the finding of uh, German bodies in New York the, Harbor. I don't know whether we were directed there or how we came about it, yeah. but I know we fished it over the side and pulled it on board. How many? One. One sailor. Did you establish that uh, he had come from a submarine? Oh, yes. I, you know, I didn't. That was done by intelligence. Yeah. But they did. They were up and down a Long Island like crazy. We were very fortunate. You told us a minute ago that New York had not been blacked out. Um, I recall this was the time you had to paint the top half of your headlights yeah. uh, to lower the light level. True. Do you feel uh, we were just simply careless? No. Uh, didn't know what was happening? We were naive, number one, and I think the Germans were taking pictures of New York Harbor on, from their subs with cameras in color, you know, not in color, but in, so they could see the lights at night. I mean, holy mackerel, we, you know, 
I think if they blacked out New York, they would have demoralized the, the whole East Coast. And actually, I think they did the right thing. If we got hit, we got hit. And the Germans had flown over there very high with a big bomber just to see if they could do it. And they came from Germany, 3,000 miles right over the city and right back. And they were waiting to get their A-bomb, and we were going to get hit with it. And that's a fact. That would have put out the lights. It would put out a few lights, yeah. yeah. But psychologically, I think it would be the... But the, those large buildings might have absorbed so much of that radiation. I don't know. I'm speculating. I, I couldn't say. But it, it was not blacked out. And neither was Jersey. I was around Jersey a great deal. And the, uh, they had just completed, in Brooklyn Navy Yard, the uh, New Jersey, the battleship New Jersey, was a beautiful ship. And she came out into New York Harbor and was going to be refitted somewhere else. But... Uh, we're lucky in New York that we didn't get hit, I'll tell you. Because they were capable. They almost had that buzz bomb, and if they had them on board subs, they could have just shot them right in there. You know, they're good for 200 miles. Like at the end of the war, and the Japs were uh, one week from the end of the war in Japan, the Japanese were off the Panama Canal with one of these subs with one of these rockets, v V1s, on it to take out one of the locks. Now, if they had done that, we'd been in a mess. We'd been in a mess. And they're very capable of doing it. That would have changed things a great oh, deal. I think so. This is 1943. Uh, you're in New York, your home base. Uh, are you attached to a ship, or are you uh, we, part yeah. of maintenance? Uh, uh, we were based basically on that pier, but we were attached to a repair ship called the Altair. Yeah. But we, we didn't go on board it. We, you know, I don't know what the story was, but we were, this was a huge place where we were. Uh, great machine shops and so forth, and specialized fellows in, in uh, all Navy people uh, involved in uh, maintenance, ship maintenance, and uh, no dry docks or anything like that. Did you see any wounded ships come in, ships yes, full of holes? Yes. Uh, uh, in New York, in Staten Island, Holleran General Hospital was where the first troops came in. You know, when they came, they were right on the island. That and, was, and how about ships that had been damaged at sea? I seen many a ship in Brooklyn that was all burned out, that was uh, tied up at, at docks and so forth. But we had nothing to do with those people. But we did get called probably in 44, we did get call from our base, which was only about four bases down from the uh, uh, port of embarkation of New York. And we had uh, a troop ship in there being loaded, and we were, we were to fix up something on their forward winch up on their bow. And I had a crew of five men that I worked with all the time, and we went over that night, and we worked for quite a few hours. And the skipper, the uh, exec told us if we didn't get off the thing by 0600, the next stop would be Manchester, England. I said, we'll be off here before then. <laughs> so we got off, and I heard a few days later she got torpedoed off the Jersey coast. The crowds are still there. And they lost a lot of people, all loaded with their gear. You know it. You know it. Is. How large a ship was this? It was a big troop ship. Uh, uh. Not a Liberty ship. Uh, a regular troop ship. We had other incidents where guys would come in from sea uh, for, and go out on liberty. And I remember one incident where uh, some sailors come out and it was raining like mad. And there's always police with the shore patrol at a, when they're coming off the base. And this guy was told to go back and get his peep coat off and get a raincoat on. Well, he was a gunner's mate. When he came back, he came back with a forty-five and shot two of the New York State Police. I mean, New York policemen. They, you know, they got him right away, but he was cracking up, I think. Those, those type of ships, a lot of duty on them. Will, you won't go wacky, but you've got to keep your wits. You know, it's very confining, very restrictive. You just have to keep common sense. You were close enough, then, to be in contact with a lot of the guys who were coming back. Oh, yes. Um, 
What did they tell you, and, and what, did, what did you observe when you saw some of these ships? They were great guys. The ships were beat, beaten like mad. The, the hulls were all bent, because they were small ships, and they were taking heavy seas. We ran into a number of French corvettes, which was a wonderful ship, anti-submarine from New York up to the north, and we drank beer with these guys in the, in the city and that. We had some great liberties with them, no problems. We were on their ships many a time repaired some of their ships. And uh, as I say, most of the time I had, I was with five people, five in my crew, and they wanted me to become chief and I wouldn't take it. I didn't feel I was ready for that stuff, you know. I said, first class machine, this is good. I'm fortunate to be here. <laughs> but that's also uh, speaks well of your knowing what you were doing. You I haven't was lucky. been in the Navy that long. Yeah. Some guys work 30 years to become a chief. Yeah, but they weren't doing this type of work. This is highly specialized work, and I was with some great people. Great people. All our officers were engineers. We had, we always had lieutenants and cam three stripers around us all the time. And I tried to get out of there twice, went up to captain's mask. That's a, you know, request. Four striper ran the base. I wanted to get out and go on subs. I went up twice, two different times. He told me the next time I come up, he was going to kick me in the rear end. He says, you're not leaving until I tell you I can leave. That was it. You, you wanted to serve on a sub? Yeah, I wanted to go on subs. I probably wouldn't have, couldn't have stood the uh, confinement. One doesn't know until they make tests for you, you know, on your personality. I might not have been able to do it. But that's the way it worked out. And um, shortly after that, I went to Norfolk. And my ship, actually, the Shannon that I went on, I understand she took two kamikazes off Okinawa and survived. And she, she was loaded with mines all along the rear, the stern, you know. She had dual mounts fore and aft, a beautiful ship. Uh, but she survived the war, and I was surprised to hear she took two kamikazes and survived. And with all that... Explosives yeah. aboard, yeah. Maybe they had dumped them in the harbors, <clears throat> I don't know, but maybe they weren't on board at the time. This is 44 now, Tom? Yeah, and just you're, about. you're going to Norfolk, Virginia, Yeah. to the big base down there. Yeah. What was your uh, assignment down there? Um, I was waiting for the Shannon to come back. she never come back, so I was on, you know, nothing much, as I recall, just whatever I was assigned to do. You were in a transit barracks? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I went to, went to uh, Liberty in Norfolk with a sign that said, Sailors and dogs keep off the grass. It's true. Marine Corps ran into the same thing, right? Yeah, we tore up the signs. Oh. <laughs> we had troubles, too. But um, uh, then uh, eventually got on a troop ship, went down to uh, the Caribbean. And uh, in November 14th, 45, I flew back. 45? 45, right. I'm sorry, 45. Flew back to New York and married my wife, who lived in the island, a beautiful kid, nice woman. And uh, as I say, we wound up with having five children, and they've all done very well. You, you kind of skipped through the end of the war here. Oh, no. I, well, <laughs> I, I did. I wound up on a troop ship going down to the Caribbean. I stayed down there on that whole training command with that three-star admiral, a two-star admiral, for quite a few months. And then, I believe in January, we, I came back on a destroyer to Norfolk and had a bunch of your friends, the Marine Corps, seasick in the back, at back aft, and I brought them back sandwiches, and they almost killed me. <laughs> I said, get out of here, Swabby. But then I, I went to, uh, up to New York, to Lido Beach, Long Island, and I was discharged there in January 46. You've, you've spoken of officers and uh, leadership that you, you had in the Navy. Uh, what, what did you think of the guys that uh, were in charge of you and commanding you? Generally, no problem at all. They were very good. They, they had their job, we had our job, and uh, we had no problem that I could aware of. Did the United States Navy uh, sit you down at any time 
and prepare you for the foreign places you were going to go to, tell you about the people you would meet, Cubans, for example? No. No. no we, as I say, we had a lot of Cubans on the base that would come in in the morning and leave in the afternoon. Yeah. And uh, they were no problem. We had no problem with them at all. Not that I'm aware of at all. They were nice people. And you got to see Brazil, um, other places in the Caribbean. Can you think of uh, places now that, uh, did you ever go back to any of these places? Um, no, but my, my wife and I and my daughter from Michigan, we took a trip to uh, Venezuela, a cruise down there, uh, you know, a few years ago. And to Bermuda, where the big base was in Bermuda, the British had, now the Chinese have. That's our rig next great problem with the Chinese, in my opinion. Who were your closest friends in the service? Oh, I had a lot. A very good friend from Kansas, about six foot three. Good guy to go on liberty with. I had a number of friends. I can't recall the names. There was great guys, no problems. And how did you? How did you hear about what was going on in the in the war, um, either in, in Europe or in the South Pacific? Scuttlebutt. We didn't hear much, to be honest with you. You know, it wasn't, uh, I didn't hear a great deal. You know, right in the city, you didn't hear it. But uh, it was great experience. Thank God I got out in one piece. A lot of guys didn't. And uh, I'm just glad to be back and, and reach the age of 70, 78 and still survive. It's remarkable, in my opinion. Well, you, you spent years uh, in the presence of dangerous machinery, a lot of high explosives, went to sea, saw some bad weather probably, yeah. and uh, evidence that ships had been sunk around you. Uh, yeah, you've uh, got a lot to remember. And I do a lot of shooting right now at my gun club, you know, and my daughters were all distinguished expert shooters right here from Natick High when they were in high school. And I still shoot trap every Sunday. Um, I hunt Montana, I've hunted Montana about six times. And uh, my son-in-law, Bob, is a big man with General Motors and his brother lives out there. So we go out with him and we've hunted, had some marvelous experiences. Shot about everything. Mm -hmm. Just great, great country. You've uh, had a lot of years to think about what you did, Tom. And there's been many, many books written about the submarine warfare in, in the war you participated in. Um, do you ever read anything and say, gosh, I remember that or I was part of that? I did have a very good friend, one of my neighbors, he got, he was in Tokyo Bay early in the war and they got trapped in there and sunk and he was gone, that ship. We lost about 40 subs in the Pacific in World War II. The Germans lost 400, 400. Very brave men. Very brave men, the submariners. I have great respect for them. And you still feel that you might have wanted to get and serve on a sub? I, I tried twice. Yeah. And, and probably just, to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably very fortunate that I didn't. You've had a lot of time to think about the war itself. Yes. Um, and the, the Germans and the Japanese. What about your perspective of the war you were in? When you, you joined at 18, uh, for very patriotic reasons. Have you ever had any reason to rethink your decision or what you did in the Second World War? Absolutely not. I, I have uh, great respect for the, uh, for the German submariners. I, have, I haven't got too much respect for the Japanese, the way they treated our people from the islands when they captured them. I have none. In fact, I would have thrown a couple more A-bombs on them, if I might say. But uh, at least when the Germans were beat, they knew they were beaten, and they gave up, and that was it. 
But my, I had a cousin killed at the Battle of the Bulge. He was captured by the Germans and brought out into that field. And I don't recall where it was. About a hundred of them had just shot down. Was this at Malmati? Yes. Yes, that's it. He was part of that? He was part of that. Bobby Burns from uh, Winchester. His father was a very wealthy mother man. And uh, he was the only son. So that was pretty tough. I, uh, I had only met Bobby a couple of times, but hated the Army when he first went in, but began to get acclimated and thought it was great. And then this happened. Did you have any opportunity as, as you were serving uh, to meet people of other nationalities? Uh, for example, the, any of the sailors off the French ships, British ships, anything like that? Oh, I met plenty of British. Plenty of Canadians. Tell us about those encounters with those people. Well, the, the, if I might digress a second. Sure. We had a lot of, early in the war, when I was in New York, we had a lot of Russians come in, and we trained them on main propulsion on anti-submarine. We had a lot of what you call yard minesweepers, beautiful ships, wooden hulls about A6, so they wouldn't be magnetic attraction to mines. And uh, <coughs> I worked on every bit of those ships. And um, the British were very, we didn't hit it off too great with the British. The Canadians, fine. British were a little. What, what was the difference? I don't know. I think they, the British probably just didn't take to the Americans that great. The Canadians were very like us. They were, we dragged together. And we'd go on their ships, and uh, we'd have the toddies of rum when, I, when they had them. Uh, I think it was late in the morning. Um, just uh, was great rapport. And while I was down the Caribbean, incidentally, uh, I had a number of Chinese, Greek, and some other nationality, I can't recall. We trained those people in, in um, the same thing that I was involved with out of New York. And uh, those probably those Chinese people are now are their admirals of their fleet. Those are the people you're going to have to watch because we're going to have real problems with them. And I don't care who likes it, I'm telling you. When you were talking to the British, was there an inference there that they had been in the war three years before you got in and uh, yes. where were you, Yank, that kind of thing? Yeah, but it's not, it wasn't our problem at the time. Um, they ought to be very glad that we did, Roosevelt did come to their aid because without Roosevelt, England would have been gone. Had England gone, we would be gone by now. We'd all be speaking German and Jap. There's no question about that. They had the capabilities. How poor England ever stood up to what she did is amazing. The good Lord must have been with them. Were you part of the United States Navy when, uh, as you said, Roosevelt stepped in and, through Lend-Lease, gave the British those 50 destroyers? Yeah. yeah, I was in high school. I was still in high school. But those were nice ships, too. In fact, I know a fellow that was on one. He was a cook. And those suckers were low in the water, and there was four stacks, and she would go. They would move. They were a very good ship. They helped the British a lot. The British were in a terrible situation. They tried to protect the Mediterranean. They tried to hold the Atlantic to get... And if Roosevelt hadn't come to their aid, and I don't care what anybody says, Roosevelt was a great man, and he proved it at that, in my opinion. Was there a most memorable experience in your whole career, something that stands out more than anything else? Well, I met my wife in New York, and we got married. That's, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been very successful so far. That was in 45. Let's 45? back up a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah, what's that, 55 years? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. She's down in Michigan right now with my uh, third oldest daughter, taking care of her new twins, helping her with her new twins. Oh, boy. The He's coming there. back today. What about uh, in the United States Navy? Can you think of something that you think back upon every once in a while? Oh, I had very dear friends that were in the Navy Air Force that got lost in the Pacific, that were in high school with me. Very good friend of mine, Joe O'Connor. And... Um, all in all, I just enjoyed the Navy very much, and we had our problems with the Marine Corps, as you know. But
but they had uh, they had our problem. We all had trouble with the Coast Guard, you know, fights and bars and that. But it was just a, a great experience, and I'm very fortunate to have survived it. Was there uh, one person, some one person that you can remember and think back upon, a memorable character in your career? Oh, Joe Paycheck from New York, another very good friend of mine. Al Lang from Philadelphia, who was quite a machinist, quite a mechanic, and an English fellow who turned down the screws for the jersey, you know, machined them. That's quite a thing. He, this, this Englishman was quite a mechanic. It was beautiful, an artist, the way he worked, the way his machinery and his equipment was handled and that. Just something to watch with him. I, I talk to him any time. No, I met some great guys that I was in the in the shop with um, chiefs that were very good to me, very nice, no problems whatsoever. It was a great experience. I feel lucky. How about uh, a humorous experience? Some night where uh, you were in a bar in New York or uh, oh, God. down in the Caribbean? We were, in a, we were on Liberty one time, about five of us, my, my four guys and me. We were over in Brooklyn, New York, and it was very dark. And we were in a bar dancing with some wild women, and uh, we came out, and we weren't feeling any pain. The boys were throwing barrels through windows, and I tried to square them away. You know, I said, let's knock this kid stuff off. We could finally get back to the base about 0500, and everything was fine, but we could have been in a real mess. We've had a number of cases, not, not as bad as that, but we've had our fights we're up in 81st. With, with the Marines and Coast Guard one time, early, <laughs> I was chairs were being thrown all over the place. It was something. <laughs> really, it was. I, I, but I, 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 uh, <laughs> I had a lot of laughs. I enjoyed <clears throat> I only had one fight, and I was down the Caribbean with a guy, and he thought I made a remark, and it wasn't me at all. It was in the dark, and I hadn't made the remark whatsoever. And I remember seeing purple stars before I hit the deck. And somebody grabbed me and said, it wasn't him, it was me. And that was another situation. But there was all humor. You just, you know, just great. I enjoyed it. When and uh, where were you discharged now? At uh, Lido Beach. Lido Beach. Long Island. Long Island. New York. And that's, your wife is from Long Island? No, she's from no. Staten Island. My Staten daughter, Island. Yeah, my oldest okay. daughter lives in Long Island now. And with what rank and what decorations? I had uh, first class machinist mate, Monomac, difference, and uh, the Atlantic uh, ribbons, that's all. Did you join any uh, reserve unit after com no, coming home? No, I, I didn't. Any veterans organizations? I was in the American Legion for a while, <clears throat> and then I got involved in uh, a small boy shooting with my girls, so I just didn't have the time to do it. So. We did that for about three or four years. My oldest girl was state champion in 40, in her senior year, which approximately was 69, I would say. You came home in 46. Um, the war had been over a couple of months, something right. like that. What were your feelings about coming home? You'd been in the Navy four yeah, years. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I couldn't, I, it was difficult to get a job, number one. I had no place to live. I had to leave my wife in New York for a couple of months because uh, my father had remarried. My mother died when I was 12. He remarried during the war, and I, I never got an invite to stay with them and my wife, so I finally found a place to one of my aunts that worked at Harvard Medical, and uh, then I brought my wife up. And then we moved from one place to another and until uh, in 1950 we moved to Natick. And uh, we've been here since. <coughs> what kind of reception did you get when you came home? Well, everybody was nice, good, no problem. Did you ever sit down with um, your dad, say, or members of your family? Did they ask you what you'd done in the war? Oh, yeah, we talked. We talked. Yeah. Now, your dad was very proud that you had gone into the service. He was, yeah. And did you guys uh, compare notes? Oh, God. What he'd done and what you had done? Uh, yes, I know what he did in, uh, in Europe and France. <coughs> and uh, he went through a lot. 
That was a tough war, the, that First World War. I think it was worse than the Second World War. I'm a student pretty much of the Civil War and the, and the recent wars. That's where I feel I can speak a, a little bit about what I see for the future of wars. Uh, and, and everybody says, a lot of people say, oh, these kids today, I said, look, these kids today will be fine. Just relax. They were just like we were when we were kids. And the American kids will come up. And if they don't, then they'll suffer the consequences. That's the way I see it. Over the archives building in Washington, D.C., it says the past is prologue. How do you draw a line between the American Civil War and, and see what's going to happen in the future of this country? Oh, the Civil War was tough. Brutal. I, I, one thing bothered me about the Civil War was we had in Tremont Street in Boston, we were making Spencer rifles, which was a semi-automatic rifle, lever-action rifle, like Winchester, only it preceded Winchester. And the Army wouldn't take them because they had different ed, 06 Springfield, or I should say Springfield ammo, and they didn't want to mix up different ammo. But some of the officers uh, from out west bought these rifles for themselves and their men. And they did a terrific job. They killed a lot of the poor rebels, and uh, we could have saved probably a lot of lives and shot in the war if they had used that rifle on a, on a larger scale. That's just a little bit of what I have to think about it. That's a good point. Tom, how important to you was serving in the military? Marvelous. I loved it. My pleasure. And do, do you feel it uh, in some way affected uh, the rest of your life? Um, it gave me a great outlook and a great understanding of uh, situations. That's, it didn't hurt me in any way that I can think of. Um, probably helped me a lot. You told us earlier when we began that you joined up in 42 for very patriotic reasons. Absolutely. Everybody was doing the same thing. Yep. Any point during your time in the service or since that you've rethought that decision or you still feel the same Absolutely. way about it? Yeah, no, no question. Do you feel that there was a difference in public opinion regarding veterans who served in your war or Korea or Vietnam? Absolutely. They treated those people terribly. World War I was so huge, 16 million people involved. Uh, Korea, those poor guys went through hell and high water and weren't treated too good at all. But the poor Nam boys, they, they were treated terribly, terribly. And uh, my opinion was for the military all the way through it. I don't care what the people thought about how good the war was or how bad the war was. Point is, we were asked to do it and we did it. And I'm very proud of the Vietnam people. Very proud. You were discharged in 1946. Right. Uh, have you at any time received any veterans' benefits, uh, hospitalization, GI Bill, insurance, anything like GI that? GI Bill, uh, when I worked, I went to work in May of 46 for Bell, Ma Bell, you know, mm -hmm. New England Tell at the time here. And they gave us on the job training uh, for a few years. It was a difference between, I think, $28 a week and 56 <laughs> And it was very helpful. And I started going to school. I started going to Northeastern. And my boss has told me, we have some big jobs coming up. They're going to be 12-hour shifts. Either go to school or go keep working, period. You couldn't do that today. But that's the way it went then. So I said, I'll forget school. So I wound up with 38 and a half years with my bill. I retired from AT&T. And it was a, a very fine company. I'm very pleased with it. Is there any one thought, one incident, one thing that I haven't asked you today that you'd like to uh, tell your family or people who will look at this tape a great many years from now? Well, all I can say is that we were very fortunate to be able to fight and come back in one piece. Tom, 
Thanks for coming in today. Okay. I appreciate it.